Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people's with equity. It's about celebrating the coming of the Lord. Jesus came once and He's going to come again. It celebrates celebrates His coming with with music. Sing sing a new song. Bring out all the instruments you have. Let's start singing. Let's make music because the Lord's coming. Is there, is there anybody, we, we get together for Christmas and stuff like that, but is there anybody who would walk through your door and you would bring out all your instruments to celebrate their arrival? Is there anybody who could walk through your door and, and you would write a, write a new song just because they're arriving? Is there anybody out there who you could possibly be so excited to see that you would write a whole new song because they just arrived. And that you would pull out every musical instrument that you had to make music. Is there anything out there, anyone, that would do that for you? Maybe there's not any human person out there who you would get that excited about seeing. Probably not. But if the Lord Jesus were to come, he would be worth getting that excited about. And we celebrate him every Christmas because he comes. But when he comes again, we're not going to need our own music. There's going to be a loud trumpet blast in the heavens, it says in the Bible. And there's going to be music, there's going to be celebration, and because he comes... He's that wonderful. That's how wonderful He is. So that just Him walking through the door is going to be that much cause for a celebration. Maybe it's hard to imagine somebody being that great. But that's how great He really is. And the more you get to know Him, the more you get to realize how wonderful He truly is and how wonderful it will be when He comes back. The song that we're going to look at today or reflect on today is Joy to the World. This is maybe one of my more favorite Christmas carols. I'm not sure I have just one, but this is one of them. Joy to the World. It's the only Christmas carol that's based on a psalm. It's based on this psalm that we just read. Joy to the World. It celebrates the coming of the Lord. If you look at the words to Joy to the World... There's not a lot that's particular to Christmas. It doesn't talk about a manger. It doesn't talk about Jesus being born or anything like that. Joy to the World is written based on Psalm 98. The only thing that's in Joy to the World that might be particular to Christmas is Joy to the World, the Lord has come. Joy to the World is actually originally sung all throughout the year because it's based on this psalm. It's not necessarily just a Christmas song. But we sing it at Christmas because the Lord has come already. He's coming again, but He already has come. And if you look at this psalm here, there's three sections there. 
The first section talks about the past, the middle section talks about the present, and then the last one talks about the future. So in verses 1 through 3, it talks about the past. The Lord has delivered us already. In the past, God has delivered us. Now when this was originally written, the, the Israelites, the Jewish people, they had a particular event in mind when they talked about the Lord saving them in the past, and that would be the exodus their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. So they would recall God saving them out of Egypt. Egypt is a defining moment for the Israelite people. Egypt is mentioned 15 times just in the Psalms. This is something that they continued to celebrate generations later. God delivered us from slavery in Egypt. And it was a very defining thing for them. It's men- Egypt is mentioned 28 times in Numbers and 49 times in Deuteronomy. This is their defining event. God saved them out of slavery in Egypt. For us, we would recall God saving us out of sin. The Bible compares living in sin to being enslaved. Because when you follow your passions and your impulses, they tend to snowball. They tend to kind of take on a life of their own. Kind of like addictions do, to the point where you are almost unthinking. You just have to do these things. This is all you know. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin, Jesus actually said. So when Jesus died for our sins, he broke that slavery, so that we no longer have to obey our sinful nature anymore. Sometimes we cave and we do, but we don't have to. He delivered us from it. So the Lord has delivered us already. We have something to celebrate now. And in the present, verses 4 through 6, the Lord is now the king. This middle section is all about, hey, bring out, bring out all the instruments because the Lord is king. We, we can celebrate and sing music to him now. He's the king now, already. And that is very true. When I was translating this passage this week. I was looking at verse 4 there. In, in Hebrew, there's only seven words in that verse. In English, you have to kind of add some words to make it make sense. But in Hebrew, there's only seven words in verse 4. And four of those seven are commands. Four of them. More than half the words are commands. Shout. Burst into jubilant song with music. That's all we have in English. But four of those seven words are commands. We, need, we are commanded to worship the Lord. It's not just, eh, when you get around to it, or if you feel like it, it's, no, do it. Worship the Lord. Celebrate Him. He's the King now. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. And then verses 7 through 9 talk about the future. It says the Lord will come to judge. He's, he's coming again. Now, when we hear the word judge, usually that kind of has some negative connotations for us. When we hear judgment, that sounds kind of bad. You know, and we often quote that those words that Jesus said, you know, don't judge lest you be judged. Yeah, when somebody judges you, that's it's kind of bad, isn't it? But when the Lord comes to judge, it's a little different. And the reason is because that human judges, we are finite. We don't know everything. We judge by appearances. We're pretty shallow. So when we make judgments about people, it's usually not good judgments. Because we don't see people for who they really are, usually. We see people for what's on the surface. But when God comes to judge... That's a little different. God is all-knowing. He knows what's in our hearts. And unlike us, he shows no favoritism. He doesn't favor good-looking people. 
He doesn't favor wealthy people. He shows no favoritism. He made all of us as we are. And so he evaluates us based on how he made us. He knows what we're capable of. So when he comes to judge, we know we're going to get a good judgment. Something that's fair and true and right. Something that we can't do. So God is coming to judge. And that's a good thing. The perfect Lord coming to judge is a joyous event to celebrate. We should, we should rejoice that God is going to judge us. Sounds kind of strange, maybe. But that's, that's what the psalm is saying. God is coming to judge. Isn't that great? That's awesome. God's coming to judge us. And that means the innocent are going to be vindicated. All of those who are guilty and got away with it, they're not going to get away with it anymore. And all of those who are in Christ and belong to Him are going to be redeemed in finality. Everybody who is proud is going to be humbled. And everyone who is immersed in shame is going to experience grace. When God comes to judge the world, good things are going to happen. So this is Psalm 98, and this is what Joy to the World is based on. Joy to the World is written by a man named Isaac Watts. He lived quite a few years ago, a number of centuries ago. He was an academic, really smart guy. He was also a minister, and he was a poet. He was uh, learning Latin by age four. He learned Greek at age nine. He had a lot of French neighbors, and so he decided that he wanted to learn French at age 11. And by 13, he was learning Hebrew. This guy was pretty smart. And especially learning some of these languages and thinking of trying to learn them at those ages. Wow, he's pretty smart. He was a scholar of wide reputation, especially in his later years. He wrote on all different kinds of topics. He had a textbook on logic that was the standard at Oxford for like 100 years. But one of his life goals was to improve church music. He wanted more joy when people worshiped the Lord. He was all about, as Psalm 98 said, singing a new song to the Lord. Because he grew up in a world where the music in every worship service was basically either just psalms or sections of scripture set to music. And uh, it was pretty, it was pretty low-key music. Pretty kind of droning a little bit. It was kind of, you know, just blah, blah, blah kind of thing. And he's like, we should, we should be rejoicing in church. This is, a, this is an exciting thing. We get to worship the Lord. So, lack of joy, lack of emotion. And there were a lot of Protestants that were starting to come up with singing new songs to the Lord. But this is what he said about the singing that he experienced. To see the dull indifference, the negligent and thoughtless air that sits upon the faces of the whole assembly, while a psalm was upon their lips, might even tempt a charitable observer to suspect the fervency of their inward religion. In other words, you know, when you're looking at these people singing joyful praises to the Lord, you might, even, even if you're nice, you might even start to wonder how sincere they really are. When, um, when you're standing up here and we're all singing these joyful songs at times, not all the songs we sing are happy and joyful, but some, some of them are, right? Like Joy to the World, for example. If you're standing up here and you're looking at everybody singing, almost nobody smiles. I don't know if you ever noticed that. Maybe sometime when you're singing, look back. So... Usually, if you're singing something like Joy to the World, it looks like this. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. This is is wonderful. 
Christ has come. We, we should be bringing out all the instruments and singing our hearts out with smiles on our faces. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. So, I'm going to ask Deirdre, because she's going to be singing up here in a little bit. When you sing Joy to the World after this sermon, I want all of you to be smiling, because this is happy. Joy to the world, not it's okay to the world. No, joy to the world. This is great. All right, I'm going to ask Deirdre, I want you all to be smiling when we sing Joy to the World. This is a happy song, okay? Okay. Anyways, so he was complaining about the, the singing in his church, and so when he was doing that, his dad says, well, why don't you write something better? Why don't you write something better? So he did. In 1707, he published hymns and spiritual songs, and he decided that he didn't want to throw out the Psalms. He wanted to sing what was in Scripture, but he decided that he was going to kind of put a little bit of a spin on it because all of the Old Testament points ahead to Christ. So all these psalms are talking about Christ. So let's put Christ in these psalms that we sing. So his loose use of the psalms actually brought a lot of criticism. Christian congregations have shut out divinely inspired psalms and taken in Watts' flights of fancy, said one critic. And uh, another one just called his songs Watts's Whims. Today's Joy to the World started out as his poem based on Psalm 98, talking about how this psalm talks about Christ. So it first appeared in one of his sets of poems. He ended up writing over 600 hymns, including some that some of you will recognize, such as I Sing the Mighty Power of God, Alas, and did my Savior bleed when I survey the wondrous cross? Jesus shall reign. We're marching to Zion. And, O oh God, our help in ages past. Those are all Isaac Watts hymns. So then later, this was after he had died, there was somebody who took his poem and put a tune with it. And it was only about a hundred years ago that this actually became a popular Christmas song. But the writer of Joy to the World actually had many reasons to complain, too. Yeah, he was a smart guy. But in 1702, he became the pastor of an uh, independent congregational chapel. It was a really prestigious position. But the year later, he began suffering from psychiatric illness that would plague him for the rest of his life. He had to pass off more and more of his work to an assistant and eventually resigned. Almost every portrait of him depicts him with a large gown with large folds to try to disguise how homely he was. There was a young woman who had read a lot of his work and was very impressed by how spiritual he was. So she started a correspondence with him, wrote to him, and uh, became his biggest fan, and over the mail proposed marriage to him, even. But when she went to see him, she later said it this way, he was only five feet tall, with a shallow face, and a hooked nose, prominent cheekbones, small eyes, and a death-like color. And as soon as she saw him, she turned around and went back home. So Isaac Watts, he was, he was alone his whole life. Not a very attractive person. But for Christians, joy comes from the Lord who comes. Not what we look like. Not who we're with. Not what we have. It comes from the Lord that we know. The Lord has come and we can have joy. Happiness is about our present circumstances, what's happening to you. We are happy when things that we like are happening to us. We think that's happiness. And sure, that might be happiness. Joy, though, is not about what's happening to us. Joy is about a future hope that's certain. And that comes from within. 
Christ dwells in our hearts by the Spirit, and so we have this hope that comes from within us. So that no matter what's going on around here, out here, we have some joy in here. In Psalm 71, I really like that psalm because it talks, it's written by somebody who's obviously older and who's suffering a lot. But it says this at one point, Though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you will again bring me up. You will increase my honor and comfort me once again. Knowing the Lord can get you through any difficulty. You can have hope for tomorrow, even when today is a disaster. You can have joy in the Lord when it's sad in the world. And you can sing things like, It is well with my soul, even at funerals, which we do here. Only the Lord coming can stop sin and sorrow from growing, as it says in the song, No more let sin and sorrow grow. Christ came once already to begin His kingdom, and He will return to complete it. The first words that Jesus says when you open the Gospel of Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, the first thing that Jesus says is, the time, or excuse me, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom is near. Jesus came to start this kingdom. If you look at the last words that he says in Matthew, it starts by saying this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus reigns now. He has come already. And he is ruling all things now. And he's going to return to complete that kingdom. And he comes to judge. In the Apostles' Creed we say, He will come to judge the living and the dead. As a judge, he will sentence sin and Satan for eternity. They're going to be gone. We're never going to have to deal with them again. They're going to be locked up, and that key is going to be thrown away. So when he comes to judge the earth, this is a time to rejoice, because all of the evil that's in this world is going to be gone. Look at the screen here with me and let's answer this question together. How does Christ's return to judge the living and the dead comfort you? In all my distress and persecution, I turn my eyes to the heavens and confidently await as judge the very one who has already stood trial in my place before God and so has removed the whole curse from me. All his enemies and mine, he will condemn to everlasting punishment. But me and all his chosen ones, he will take along with him into the joy and glory of heaven. Sorry, that looked okay on my screen when I was making that. He's going to take us into the joy and the glory of heaven. When he comes to judge the world, that's a comfort to us. And as king, he will rule with truth and grace. He's going to finish that kingdom. He's going to set the world straight and he's going to rule this world. And he's going to rule with truth and grace. Like the song says, he rules the world with truth and grace. And he makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. If you look at different nations and different peoples, they each kind of have their own strengths and weaknesses. When all things are said and done and Christ rules the whole world, if you think about the best of all the corners of the world, all the best stuff from everywhere is going to come together and it's going to prove God's goodness. And God's going to use it all to be a blessing to all. That's just kind of how I think about it anyways. The best stuff of this world is going to be used to be a blessing. And even nature will be restored. If you noticed when we were reading verses 7 and 8, let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Even nature is going to be restored. 
in the song, it says, And heaven and nature sing. And he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, and it wasn't just human beings that fell, it says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Things are not going to work right in nature either. And, and they don't. It's, the ground is going to produce thorns and thistles for you. But even nature is going to be restored. When Christ comes to judge, the rivers are going to clap their hands and the mountains are going to sing for joy. Yes, finally. It's going to be made right again. And because God is already in the future, He's a God who's not just of the past or the present, but also the future. He's already in the future and He keeps His promises. We can celebrate the victory even before it happens. We can celebrate today because of what is going to happen. Even though it hasn't happened yet, we can start celebrating now. I mean, it's not technically Christmas yet, is it? But some of you are having get-togethers today. Some of you maybe have had get-togethers already. Even though it hasn't happened yet, it doesn't mean you can't celebrate it ahead of time, right? Even though Christ hasn't come back yet, it's going to happen. We can celebrate it now even. He's coming. In the Beatitudes, it talks about how blessed are those who mourn. They're blessed now because they are going to be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they now because they will inherit the earth. We can rejoice now. Because we know that what's coming is going to happen. There's a quote that I have came across. This is from somebody who's serving in Afghanistan. This is from a couple years ago, but he said this. Jesus did not come just to provide an occasion to sing carols, drink toasts, feast, and exchange gifts. But we are right to do these things. Even as soldiers die and families grieve, because he came, and in his coming, he brought joy and peace, the joy that overcomes our sorrows, and the only kind of peace that ultimately matters. Somebody from serving in Afghanistan. We are right to celebrate even when there is sorrow. Because joy comes from knowing the Lord who works wonders in the past, in the present, and in the future. If you know this Lord and you are close to Him, then you are close to even what is going to happen. He's not just a God of the past. He's a God of the future. So when you sing joy to the world, at least this is what I think of when I sing it, I want you to make it your declaration of Christ's victory even in this sad world. He won. And he's going to come and He's going to fix everything. There can be joy to the world now. Make it your celebration of everything that is going to come. So sing joy to the world and celebrate the arrival of Jesus. He came once. He's coming again. We can sing joy to the world. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, we are so grateful that we can celebrate your victory. Your victory over Satan and sin and all evil. Lord, we can even celebrate that now, even while evil still is in the world. The Lord, help us to sing with joy and delight because of who you are and what you have done and what you will do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.